Hello, everybody. Welcome to the History Valley Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Lena Einhorn. She's the author of this book, A Shift in Time, How Historical Documents Reveal the Surprising Truth About Jesus. Welcome back to the podcast, Lena. Thank you. So tell us, um, what led you to the conclusion that Jesus lived in another era in the first century? Uh, well, it, it was... Uh, it, it was uh, very deeply hidden, <laughs> I, I would say, for me, uh, because I did what I had. I started out with an, with another separate hypothesis, and uh, I did what so many people have done before me. I started comparing the New Testament with other uh, sources from the time, historical sources, uh, and mainly, of course, Josephus. Um, and uh, you know, and I read other more current material as well and like everybody else i realized there were some chronological problems and like everybody else i put them aside i mean the issue of the fact that uh, in in the acts of the apostles uh, theodos is mentioned as somebody who was active before the crucifixion of 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 jesus uh even a long time ago, and after that, they say uh, Judas the Galilean was active, which is obviously wrong because Theodos, uh, according to Josephus, was active in the mid 40s, and Theodos way before, uh, sorry, Judas the Galilean way before Theodos. So, you know, I noticed all these strange things, and like everybody else, I put them aside. I mean, the most common chronological problem of course that everybody uh, sort of knows is is the difference between the birth story of Matthew and Luke where where Matthew puts the birth of Jesus before the death of Herod the Great which is 4 BCE and and uh, Luke puts it at the time of the census of Quirinius which is around 6 CE so you know there are lots of these problems but there were also problems, chronological problems that uh, that I was that people usually don't talk about. Uh, for instance, uh, Jesus is crucified with robbers. Now, uh, Josephus writes plenty about robbers. They're actually Jewish rebels, um, but he doesn't mention them at all uh, in the time of Jesus. In fact, he doesn't mention them between six and forty-four. So no, no robbers are mentioned in the time of Jesus. And of course, then we have the fundamental problem, which is that um, although Jesus is portrayed uh, in the Gospels as somebody with a great following and his trial, you know, is frequented by, by the leaders, both the Roman and the Jewish leaders and, and two high priests, uh, we don't find him in the historical sources if you take aside the testimony of Flavianum which is, according to everybody, not, at least not original uh, as it stands. So, so, you know, I saw these things, but then I started seeing something that, um, that sort of annoyed me almost. Uh, and that was that uh, if there weren't any messianic leaders mentioned in the Jewish realm, at the time of Jesus in Josephus' writing, there were plenty of them uh, before and after in, in the time of, of rebellion. It, this was a period of rebellion, the first century. But there was one, one rebel, one messianic leader in particular that I sort of kept coming back to that is, this looks awfully similar to Jesus. Uh, and that is a, a rebel leader by the name of the Egyptian that Josephus describes as being active in the time of Felix, which is in the 50s. We're talking around 20 years after Jesus is supposed to have been crucified, if he was crucified in the time of Pilate. And uh, the similarities were, you know, they were very clear. I mean, uh, he, he came from the wilderness to Jerusalem, he preached on the Mount of Olives, like Jesus, he had a great following on the Mount of Olives, and he was saying to people that he was going to tear down the walls of Jerusalem, or that the walls of Jerusalem were going to be torn down, 
as as we see also in the New Testament. Um, but, and he was defeated in the same place as Jesus. He was defeated on the Mount of Olives. But there were three clear differences, of course. First of all, it was the wrong time. It's 20 years too late. Second of all, he was not crucified. It, what uh, Josephus writes about the Egyptian is that there was a, a huge battalion of um, Roman soldiers that were sent out by the Roman procurator, Felix, against uh, the Egyptian and his followers on the Mount of Olives. And a lot of them were killed and a lot of them were crucified. But, Josephus writes, the Egyptian escaped out of the fight and was not heard from again. So he was not crucified. And then third, of course, whereas Jesus was resting with his disciples on the Mount of Olives, waiting uh, for, the, uh, for the men from the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin, to come and arrest him. Uh, in the case of, of, of the Egyptian, there was this uh, huge amount of soldiers and there was a battle um, on the Mount of Olives. So I just you know, I just noticed it and I didn't attribute any value to it. I just thought that's weird. And then we had all those other things that along with it, you know, that there were all these other chronological errors that 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 didn't fit. But then late one night I was uh, reading a translation of the original Egyptian, uh, uh, sorry, Greek text of the Gospel of John. And the difference between the Synoptic Gospels, uh, when it comes to the arrest of Jesus, the difference between the Synoptic Gospels and John is that whereas the Synoptic Gospels say that uh, Jesus was arrested by the Jewish police from Sanhedrin, from the Jewish council, John says that the Jewish men were accompanied by the captain and his guards. There are different translations, but basically the captain and his guards. But when you look at the original translation, uh, the original Greek, the word for the captain is kliarkos, and the, and the word for the guards is spera. And the spera is a Roman cohort with a paper strength of 1,000 soldiers. And kliarkos means leader of 1,000. So when I read this, it was like everything sort of, hit me like a thunderbolt almost, because obviously you don't send out 1,000 soldiers to arrest a man. You send out 1,000 soldiers uh, to go to battle. And, and, and then suddenly there were all these indications, of course, that there was a battle with Jesus, according to Luke, telling his uh, disciples to bring swords to the Mount of Olives. And, and, the, and the story of, of the cutting of the ear up in the Mount of Olives. Uh, so when, but it was like, a, it was really like a thunderbolt when, when, when I read this translation and I realized that, you know, the similarities were stunning. And then suddenly all these other chronological errors, which all seemed to fit this 20 year, 15 to 20 year time difference fell into place. I want to show everybody something just real quick. Um, so here's a slide uh, from an uh, from an image that uh, you use in an article, I think, somewhere. Um, uh, that's from the book, I think, from a yeah, shift in yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, I misspoke there slightly. So here you have you indicate that multiple events in the New Testament occurring in the 30s and 20s is happening in the 40s and 50s. Right, could you talk about this? Well, I mean, it, it, it's sort of, you know, here they're sort of lined up. Uh, what I was speaking about before, there are there are plenty of chronological errors and, and these were sort of building up. And here I'm listing, for instance, that robbers, uh, according to the New Testament, were active in uh, during Jesus' crucifixion, which, according to the chronology of the New Testament, had to be between 28 and 36. Um, and they're not there, 28 to 36, according to Josephus. They're there 
before the census revolt in six, and they're there basically from the year 48 and then up through the Jewish war. Uh, same with crucifixions, uh, although this is not something that he speaks as much about. He doesn't mention any crucifixions in the time of Jesus, aside from in the testimony of Flavianum. Josephus doesn't. Then you have the conflict between Samaritans and Galileans, uh, which is clearly indicated in, in the New Testament, in the Gospels, whereas, Galilean, uh, whereas Samaritans are mentioned <coughs> sorry, uh, in the Acts of the Apostles, which is sort of a later phase, and there, there is no indication of conflict. Um, so there you have an indication of conflict in the 30s, whereas there was a war between Galileans and Samaritans, according to Josephus, between 48 and 52. Then you have the two co-reigning high priests, Caiaphas and Annas, and they weren't co-reigning. They were not there at all at the same time, according to Josephus. There were three high priests between them, but there were two other co-reigning high priests, which were at that time. Uh, uh, so so Jonathan, their name was Jonathan and Ananias. Uh, then you have the, this very strange thing about Stephanus. There's only one Stephen in the Bible, Stephanos, and there's only one Stephen, Stephanos, in, in, the, um, in, in the works of, of Josephus. And both of them were attacked by a mob on a road outside Jerusalem. Uh, but then there are these strange differences, or perhaps not so strange. I mean, they're not the same kind of person. And, and, and uh, this is what's so fascinating, that there are when you see these parallels, they're very clear. And at the same time, there are distinct differences. And we can talk a little bit about that. Uh, then you have the, uh, of course, you have a messianic leader by the Jordan, by the Jordan River, which is uh, John the Baptist uh, in the case of Jesus. And you have a messianic leader on the Jordan, which is the predecessor of the Egyptian, also in the case of Josephus. And that is Theodos. Um, I don't know if there's anything more on this list. Oh, pro a procurator killing uh, Galileans. Um, you have this in the New Testament about Pontius Pilate uh, shedding the blood of Galileans, but he he wasn't even the, the, the leader of the Galileans. He was the leader of the Judeans. But Felix was the leader of the Galileans, and he certainly shed the, the blood of the Galileans. He was crucified, crucifying Galileans and robbers en masse. So you and you have this. You have a very clear rebellion in the time of of, uh, of Felix and around that time, basically after forty eight. But you don't have any rebellion in the time of Jesus. And and still, it says that Barabbas, Barabbas, who 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 was let go and Jesus was crucified, was a leader of a rebellion. So. Um, these are just some of the, the parallels that sort of don't fit with the 30s, but suddenly you see very clear similarities at later stages. So I feel that this slide is uh, necessary to, to show exactly where the Egyptian is mentioned by Josephus, because th there are some people that I've seen that have uh, misunderstood what you're saying. Instead of, oh, is she saying Jesus is Egyptian from Egypt? It's like no, she's talking about a character. She's talking about a person that's living in the middle right. of the first century. And, and I mean, that's obviously also a parallel, since Matthew says that Jesus came from Egypt in when he was a, a child. But the very strange thing is that he comes from Egypt as a child at the same time as um, John the Baptist starts preaching uh, in Matthew. It says at that time John the Baptist started preaching. Uh, uh, on the River Jordan, and they are the same age. So how could he come as a child? Now, the whole thing with Jesus having been in e Egypt is something that has traveled through Jewish history for centuries. And it's mentioned in, in the Talmud. It's mentioned also uh, by Celsus, who wrote very early, wrote, wrote in 175. He was not a Jew, but he was probably getting his information from Jews. And he said very clearly that Jesus was the son of a poor woman and a Roman soldier by the name of Pantera, who, because of his poverty, traveled to Egypt for work as an adult and uh, came back, uh, you know, filled with magic, magical knowledge. So this came 
this came from, he was a Greek, Celsus, who wrote this, and he was actually quoted by Origen, who was a church father. So this is a very early source, uh, basically placing Jesus in Egypt, not as a child, like Matthew says, but as an adult. And there are several other, it says there are several sort of church uh, individuals attached to the church who through the ages say the Jews call him the Egyptian destroyer, the Jews say he came from Egypt. So this is sort of something that has traveled in sort of the parallel history. But uh, the one you're picking up here is from Jewish war. Uh, that's a little sort of uh, more negative. Uh, do you also, have, we can read both of them, but do you also have the one from antiquities? Because he spends quite a lot of time on the Egyptian. Um, we can start with this. So, so he says, he calls him a false prophet which is a stronger words than he uses in, in, in his other works, uh, Antiquities. So he writes, Josephus, there was an Egyptian false prophet that did the Jews more mischief than the former, for he was a cheat and pretended to be a prophet also and got together 30,000 men that were deluded by him. These he led round about from the wilderness to the mount, which was called the Mount of Olives. He was ready to break into Jerusalem by force from that place. And if he could but once conquer the Roman garrison and the people, he intended to rule them by the assistance of those guards of his that were to break into the city with him. Do you also have the one from Antiquities? Which actually yeah, I can mentioned... pull up right now. Uh, I just have to get this. It's not in the slides, so I'm getting it updated into the slides. Uh, okay. Or I can. It'll take a I quick moment. It. Okay, I'll, I'll uh, see if I can get it here and read it out loud. No, I have it. I just, I just need a second. Okay, I have I it here. It. Oh, okay. No, uh, okay. So, ah, uh, okay. So it starts like this. There came out of Egypt about this time. Ah, uh, you have a different uh, translation. Okay, so we'll do this slightly. This is a different translation. I'll, I'll, I'll read it. I'll read it uh, uh, as I have it. Okay. Uh, there came out of Egypt about this time to Jerusalem one that said he was a prophet and advised the multitude of the common people to go along with him to the Mount of Olives, as it was called, which lay over against the city and at the distance of five furlongs. He said further that he would show them from hence how, at his command, the walls of Jerusalem would fall down. And he promised them that he would procure them an entrance into the city through those walls when they were fallen down. Now, when Felix, that's procurator Felix, was informed of these things, he ordered his soldiers to take their weapons and came against them with a great number of horsemen and footmen from Jerusalem and attacked the Egyptian and the people that were with him. He also slew 400 of them and took 200 alive but the Egyptian himself escaped out of the fight, but did, did not appear anymore. So that's, that's from Jewish Antiquities, which is a later text by Josephus. Um, so now, uh, maybe we should say this, say, say this also, that if one accepts a time shift, and the question is, why would one believe there is a time shift? Maybe I should address that. As you could see from, from the previous slide, uh, um, Josephus hates the messianic leaders and he hates the rebels. He, and he calls the Egyptian a false prophet. I mean, he has reasons for hating them. I mean, they were fighting on the same side in the Jewish war, but he then moved. He became a, 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 you know, he, he became a Roman, basically. He, he went to the enemy, uh, Josephus. And so for that and perhaps other reasons, he couldn't stand uh, the rebels and their messianic leaders. And he certainly was ne very negative with regard to the Egyptians. So the only reason I can think of that you would want to move everything 20 years later, or rather earlier, from the 50s to the 30s, 
is to not have a competing account. And Josephus was very, very famous in his own time. I mean, he had a statue in Rome uh, and, and his works were displayed in the, in the large libraries. And so, you know, by moving it to a time when there was no competing account, you do two things. You don't have a competing account, but you also lose Jesus as a historical person, which obviously has been done since there is no there is no other parallel to him in the 30s uh, in Josephus or other historical sources. Um, now, so if one accepts that there is a shift, a time shift like this, of about 20 years. Um, and if one accepts that there really was a battle, which actually the the Gospel of John says, that there was a spera, you know, a thousand soldiers, at least the paper strength of thousand soldiers, coming up to attack uh, uh, or coming up to arrest <laughs> Jesus uh, on the Mount of Olives. Then there's only one difference remaining, and that's the crucifixion. Uh, and here we come to the interesting story of Barabbas, because Barabbas was a rebel leader, according to to the uh, to the um, uh, to the New Testament. According to uh, he's mentioned in several gospels, and uh, he was going to be crucified. But as Jesus was going to be crucified, Barabbas was let go, and he was not crucified. Now. In Matthew, Barabbas has a first name, and his first name is Jesus. His name is Jesus Barabbas in Matthew. And what does Barabbas mean? Well, Bar means son of, and Abba means father. So the name of Barabbas, according to Matthew, is Jesus, son of the father. So Jesus, son of the father, escaped out of the fight or escaped out of being crucified, whereas Jesus of Nazareth was crucified. Ah, here you've put up the mention of robbers, right? Yeah. Before you continue, I just want to do something real quick. Um, so back, Lord of the Four Corners, thank you for your super sticker. And Golem One, thank you for your super chat. No questions so far. Okay, so could you tell the audience what's happening in this figure? In what? Could you tell the eyes what's happening in this figure, figure one? Oh, okay. So uh, this is actually all the mentions of robbers or robbery or robber, any word with robber in it, uh, in uh, and that's in the Greek underneath, but with uh, Latin letters, uh, in Josephus' writings before the Jewish war, because after the Jewish war starts, there's so many of them that the, you know, the, the staples go through the roof. But this is be up until the, the Jewish war, all the times that he says the word robber or robbery or whatever. And you see how many it is on this on the on the Y, uh, what do you call it, Axel? Um, now, uh, the yellow is when he mentions the word robber, but without mentioning any actual activity. I mean, any violent activity, basically, because they were rebels. And the red is when he's mentioning robbers being active as rebels. And so you can see that it really, the, the rebellion really starts when the Romans uh, occupy in 63 BCE, because the Jews had, had, had been independent for 100 years. And, and when the Romans then come and occupy the Jewish realm, the robberies start, and then they continue until the tax census under Quirinius in the year six, which is really interesting because uh, the New Testament, or Luke says this is the birth of Jesus. In fact, it's the birth of the rebellion. Um, this is actually, one could see say, okay, there was rebellion before, but when one talks about the rebellion that ultimately led to the Jewish war, one usually sees uh, Judas the Galilean who, who was in charge of the rebellion in the year six as sort of the starting point of the rebellion. So, so they are really, you know, clobbered down by the Romans in the year six, the rebels, and, and they are held at bay 
basically all through until the year 44. Um, now, what happens in the year 44? Well, in the year 41, the Jews had finally again gotten a Jewish leader. Although it was a client leader of the Romans, it was a Jewish leader, not a Roman procurator. And he was very much loved. His name was Herod Antipas I. And in the year 44, after only three years then, when he was over the whole country for three years, um, he suddenly dies. Uh, and it, it probably was poisoned, um, probably by the Romans. And the Roman procurators come back. And this starts the rebellion anew. And uh, it's really only very little mention between 44 and 48. But in 48, it really, really starts with, with some major events. And the, and the two major events really is, and this is also interesting, is the war between Galileans and, 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 uh, and the Samaritans which, uh, of course, is mentioned in the New Testament, and the uh, killing of Stephanos, the, the attack on Stephanos, which leads to an uproar, and which is also mentioned in the New Testament. And after that, the rebellion really starts anew. And you have, uh, from 44, you start seeing these um, uh, messianic leaders again. First, you see uh, Theodos, and he come, he's killed. And this is really interesting because Theodos is preaching at the River Jordan, just like John the Baptist. And uh, the, the Roman prefect is sending out soldiers and they kill him. And what do they do with him? Well, they cut off his head and carry it to Jerusalem, just in the same way as the head of, of John the Baptist is cut off. So the next messianic leader that... Josephus mentions after Theodos, which obviously has great similarities to John the Baptist, is the Egyptian in the 50s. And the Egyptian has great similarities to Jesus. And then there are a couple of more messianic leaders that are talked about as we come to the Jewish war. Ah, here's the Samarian Samaritans. Um, so again, I mentioned it before, there was a war between 48 and 54. And so when you read in Josephus about Samaritans, the, the only time it's connected with conflict with Jews is 48 to 54. There is one mention of something uh, between 6 and 12. But otherwise, when Samaritans are mentioned, it's never uh, in connection with the conflict only during those war, uh, warriors, which doesn't mean that there wasn't some, uh, you know, latent uh, tensions, but it's not mentioned by Josephus. Now, if you look at um, the New Testament, you only see the mention of conflict between Samaritans and Jews in the time of Jesus. You don't see it in the Acts of the Apostles. You see mentioning of Samaritans, but not in connection with any conflict. And there is also a very interesting uh, segment that you can uh, compare about, uh, I'll read them, uh, about what starts this war. Uh, let's see here. And while you do that, I'm gonna address this next super sticker. Simon okay. Asplon, thank you for your super sticker. Okay, so so here you have the text in uh, Antiquities by Josephus, and this is how the war between the uh, Samaritans and the Galileans start. Okay, and you have to remember that Jesus and his disciples were Galileans; they were from Nazareth. Okay, so it was the, this is Josephus. It was the custom of the Galileans when they came to the holy city at the festivals to take their journeys through the country of the Samaritans. And at this time there lay in the road they took a village that was called Guinea, which was situated in the limits of Samaria and the Great Plain, where certain persons thereto belong, a belonging fought with the Galileans and killed a great many of them. So, uh, so Josephus here describes how 
how when the Galileans were going to Jerusalem for the festivals, presumably Passover, they met Galilee, uh, Samaritans in a particular village uh, called Guinea, and there was a fight. And then, uh, and, 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 and a lot of the Galileans, uh, and uh, a lot of the Galileans were killed. Now, in, in uh, another one of his books, Josephus writes that this led to a Jewish response where the Galileans, the robbers, set the villages of the Samaritans on fire. Okay. Now, compare this text to Luke, which is obviously 20 years earlier. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, that's Jesus, he set his face to go to Jerusalem and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. Now here again, you see, it, it, you see, of course, there's a time difference, but you see one little difference. In the first case, they burn down the villages. In the second case, in the New Testament, Jesus says, no, let's not call down fire on them. And this is something... Whenever you see these parallels, they're not, they're, they, sometimes they're clear cut, but often there is like a little twist that makes it the opposite. So here there's a pacifist action instead of, of a violent action. Yeah, there you have it, exactly. You want me to go to you want me to go ahead and get to the next slide after this? Uh sure. Okay. Uh actually this is this is we've we've talked about this. This is a, a slide that's sort of earlier than the one we saw before. Okay. Oh, here's just the list where you can see that the, there's nothing that fits between these two tales. I mean when you look at Josephus, who is our absolutely main source of, of history at that time in the Jewish realm, if you compare the New Testament and Josephus' writing, the names are there of dignitaries. You, see, you, you read about the names, the same names in both places. You read about Herod Antipas, you read about the uh, Emperor Augustus and Tiberius, you read about Annas and Caiaphas, you... You read about uh, Archelaus, I think even you read about Herod the Great. All of those people are there, but they don't do the same thing. And it's not in the same periods that the things that happen in the New Testament happen according to Josephus. So here's just a list of this, like all the things that happen in the New Testament, uh, robbers active, crucifixions of Jews, Two, two named co-reigning high priests, a procurator slaughtering Galileans. We've mentioned all these. This is just a rehash, basically, of the, of the same thing. They don't happen under Pilate in, in, uh, in Josephus' writing. They happen under other procurators and mainly under Felix. Christopher Malloy says, great conversation, thanks. Well, thank you, Christopher, and thank you for your super chat. Okay, let's get to the next slide. Okay, here is just that there is one similar. You do have one similarity. Uh, uh, there. So the question is: Is there anything that does fit both time-wise and name-wise and content-wise? Yes, there are certain things, but they are never in the time of G when Jesus is active. So one of the things that fits time-wise is the census under Quirinius. It's at 6 CE. It doesn't say 6 CE, but it is sort of, it, it fits time-wise. And there's a few things that are mentioned also in the Acts of the Apostles that seem to fit time-wise. But in the period of the Gospels, 
uh, or rather in the period when Jesus is active, according to the Gospels, there's not one single event, one single happening that, that you see in both places. You just see these names. Ah, here we come to a very, this, this is, this people really have to read on their own. Uh, this is what's so fascinating that when you, when, when you look at all these parallels between the Jesus and the disciples and what happened 20 years later in Josephus, it doesn't end there. It's such a clever book, the New Testament. It's incredibly clever because Although the New Testament, all the parallels of the New Testament that you then see in Josephus, all of them deal with a rebellion. All of them, the, of those parallels that I have brought up. I'm not talking about names. I'm talking about actions that, that fit. But not all of them are in the time of the Egyptian. And the Jewish war comes into focus too. And here you see parallels and you really people really have to read it on their own between the acts of the apostles and it's a consecutive writing i mean I, i'm not breaking it up i'm breaking it up but i don't i don't take away any text so the whole this is like one two three pages four pages of 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 text from the acts of the apostles and next to it is is the same thing from from antiquities and from war of the jews and you see that the story they tell is basically the same but with some small twists um and this is this is describing events during the jewish war it's not describing uh, events during the egyptian and what one can see if one looks at them next to each other like this is that peter saint peter also seems if if John the Baptist seems to have a very strong parallel in Theodos, and if uh, Jesus seems to have a very strong parallel in the Egyptian, then Saint Peter also has a very strong parallel, but with a much later figure. He's called Menahem, and he was a messianic leader at the very beginning of the Jewish war. And what's interesting is that almost all of these messianic movements that, are, that you find parallels to are in connection with the Sicari, which are, you know, the knife men. Uh, and and uh, Menahem, Menahem actually went to Masada, which is a rock uh, in, in, uh, in the desert by the Dead Sea, um, <laughs> which is... You know, if you, you have to read this and you see parallel after parallel between these two texts and if they are correct and, and they're hard to they hard to to sort of uh, dispel or, or throw away, then Menahem and Peter is the same person. And Peter's name, of course, means the rock. Um, but but people have to read this themselves. But it's it's not cut out. It's actually cons it's it's consecutive writing in the in the in the Acts and in Josephus' two books. It's just cut, it's just cut, uh, you know, to, to be placed next to each other, but it's not, it's not jumbled or anything. Ah, yeah, we're jumping fast. Eh? <laughs> okay. So, uh, sh shall we end with this? Because I, I actually yeah, have that's to... Fine. Um, yeah, yeah. so, so the question is, there are so, I have a whole chapter in the book and also in the article, which, which, uh, you find on online, it's called Jesus and the Egyptian prophet is the article. Uh, and it was presented, I presented it at the society of biblical literature annual conference in Chicago in uh, 2012. So it has a whole chapter of what are the arguments against the time shift? And I bring up all the arguments. When I presented at the, at the Society of Biblical Literature conferences, I was at several of them. They always, the people in the, in the hall always put up these arguments that, that are, you know, very valid arguments. Um, and, 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 and I sort of address them. Uh, and perhaps the most important argument is the issue of, okay, so if Jesus was active 
in in the 50s and not in the 30s, then what do we do with Paul and his long period of of, uh, traveling around the Mediterranean? How could he come back at the end to Jerusalem and there is still a high priest there? I mean, by that time, Jerusalem is, is lost. You know, by by the year 70, Jerusalem has fallen and there are no high priests in Jerusalem at all. It's It's been destroyed. The Jews have been dispersed around the world or around the Mediterranean, at least. So how does it fit time-wise? And, and in that chapter, um, I address this issue that actually, you know, it takes too long to go into the details here. But basically, it is it, if you if you compare the the two main texts of of Paul, which is the Acts of the Apostles and his letters, you see that there is an empty, a period of empty space of about 17 years that's put uh, into the text. So it's sort of prolonged. It will take too long to to go into it here, but it it does, it still does. So that makes Paul's... uh, uh, you know, when basically it puts many of his travels in uh, around the, uh, the Mediterranean after his final trip to Jerusalem. But people have to read this themselves. I mean, it's a, it's it's a, it's a complicated setup. Well, thanks for joining me once again, Lena. And I thank, thank everybody else that super chatted their questions. I appreciate their continued support of the channel. And I also thank everyone else that participated in the live chat session. And I will see all of you later. Thanks again, Lena. Thank you. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.